Good morning, campers. This is the second in a series on chapter 26 from Mary Ebb's Human Anatomy and Physiology text uh, on fluid electrolyte and pH balance. Um, in our first session, we talked about um, fluid balance, regulation of fluid volumes in different compartments of the body, what are those compartments and so forth. And the next section is about electrolyte balance. Um, electrolytes, again, refer to the charge species that are dissolved in the extracellular fluid and intracellular fluid. And the funny thing is, regulation of electrolytes is tied to regulation of fluid balance and so forth. So we're going to find out that we can try to conceptually isolate these topics, but only with some success. And that's okay. It's going to be excellent for us to treat each one of these things, and we'll have plenty of chance to review some, some very important principles. So <clears throat> salts, particular sodium chloride, um, are the most prevalent solutes in the extracellular fluid, and they control the movement of fluids by osmosis, and, and during transport, for example, um, when we transport uh, sodium chloride across the tubule uh, cell membrane in the kidneys, water follows by osmosis. Same thing in the small intestine. When we reabsorb uh, salts across the epithelium in the intestine, uh, then we drag water across uh, by osmosis. There's also secondary active transport happening in both cases, and the movement of solutes with the sodium also contributes to that drive for osmosis. Um, the electrolytes are really important, as you know. We talked about resting membrane potentials and action potentials and the importance of the uh, ion concentration gradients that are produced by the primary active transporters in order to create those uh, those changes in membrane potential and so forth involved in muscle contraction and, and neuron excitation and signaling. So a lot of good reasons to uh, maintain the correct concentration of electrolytes in our body. So salts enter the body by ingestion. We consume them in our diet um, and then they're lost from the body through uh, familiar means. Perspiration does contain some salt even though it's um, hypotonic uh, in the feces and urine, possibly in vomit and pathological conditions. <clears throat> Here's a table that uh, highlights um, different types of imbalances in electrolyte concentrations and their possible causes and consequences. And I, I don't want to go through every part of this of this table, but I do want you to focus on some things in this table and will some of them will actually bring out later in this discussion. So sodium, sodium concentration, if we have hypernatremia, that means too much sodium, highly concentrated sodium, and um, the biggest cause of that is probably dehydration. If we have water escaping from the body and leaving the salts behind, the electrolytes behind, we're going to have an increase in sodium concentration. Um, <clears throat> so that's going to cause us that going to cause some major problems with respect to, again, neuron signaling. We talked it's, it has an important role in controlling the membrane potentials during action potentials and so forth. So um, there's a lot of neuromuscular problems associated with hypernatremia. Hyponatremia, if we have, we just talked a little bit of, ago in the last session about um, when we have too much water on board. And then um, we have too much water on board, either from drinking too much water, uh, or if we don't have enough aldosterone in the, in the body, in the, in the secreted circulation, secreted into the circulation, I'm sorry, then we won't be able to reabsorb the appropriate amount of sodium in the distal tubule of the kidneys and collecting ducts, and we'll have hyponatremia. One thing I didn't emphasize, but is probably worth mentioning for people that are interested in athletics, um, one time when normal people may be most likely to get hyponatremia is perhaps during long duration athletic activities. So you're sweating a lot over, over hours of time, uh, outside in a hot sun, for example, for hours at a time, and you get so thirsty, you just start drinking and drinking more water, continue to play or running, say, a marathon, and keep on drinking water at all the, at all the, the, the different water uh, opportunities. And uh, if you're not taking in electrolytes, you may wind up with hyponatremia as you continue to drink all that excess water driven by the thirst response. Um, <clears throat> Also, if you had too much ADH, you'd be taking on too much water. There's, there's such a thing as, um, as uh, sporadic examples in the population of excess ADH secretion. Anyway, um, if we have 
The biggest problem probably with hypotonic hydration or, and hyponatremia is the possibility that we'll have rising intracranial pressure and there'll be uh, some really depressed uh, central nervous system function, uh, possibly leading to um, loss of muscular control, irritability and convulsions and even death. If the intracranial pressure rises too high, as we said in the previous section, uh, it won't be possible for blood uh, to circulate adequately to the cerebrum and other parts of the brain. And so we have this uh, problem of too much pressure in there and now we have insufficient blood delivery and so forth. So uh, that could lead to uh, circulatory shock. Okay, potassium hyperkalemia could be caused by renal failure. If we, if we can't secrete the potassium into the urine under the control of aldosterone, then we may have hyperkalemia, too much potassium. If we have uh, not enough aldosterone secreted, again, we may not have that secretion happening of potassium into the distal tubule and collecting duct, and we may have uh, hyperkalemia. Um, uh, can cause nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, bradycardia. We, too much potassium will interfere with the resting membrane potential and with repolarization of, of cells that depend on action potentials such as the heart cells and all the neurons in your nervous system. So um, you may have muscles, you may have muscle pulp paralysis, also skeletal muscles. All those cells depend on the proper concentration of, of potassium. Hypokalemia, um, if you have uh, vomiting or some other problem with the GI tract and you're not able to absorb potassium uh, effectively from your diet, um, if you have Cushing syndrome, um, if you have uh, malnutrition, uh, hyperaldosteronism, those are things that can cause uh, excess potassium to accumulate or uh, to, to be secreted into the distal tubule or lost from the body by those other means. And uh, we're going to have problems again because K potassium is eventually going to begin leaching out of the cells as the extracellular fluid levels go down. And so we need that big gradient from intracellular potassium to extracellular potassium for um, resting membrane potential and for uh, repolarizing cells after action potentials. And that we're going to lose that intracellular potassium concentration over time. That's going to cause all kinds of problems, including uh, the heart may uh, they stop beating. And, uh, <clears throat> calcium concentrations. Calcium is an important signaling ion. As you know, we've talked about that a couple of different times. It's critical uh, that we have the right concentration of calcium in the blood. All your muscle cells depend on calcium that they store in the sarcoplasmic reticulum for contraction, or smooth muscle cells depend on extracellular calcium in the plasma, in the, in the, in the fluid around the cells. Uh, potassium is important for exocytosis of neurotransmitters, all kinds of things um, that we need calcium for. So um, what could cause uh, too much calcium? Um, too much parathyroid hormone. If there's, if there's a tumor producing too much parathyroid hormone, then we're going to be leaching calcium out of the blood or out of the bone matrix, I'm sorry, constantly reabsorbing too much calcium in the kidneys and so forth. And, uh, and we're going to have hypercalcemia. Uh, a lot of cancers, for some reason, are associated with this ion imbalance also. Um, so what are we going to have if we have hypercalcemia? It's going to inter inter interfere with uh, neuromuscular functioning because of the importance of calcium in, in those things that I just mentioned. Um, hypocalcemia, if you uh, lose too much calcium, you don't have enough vitamin D to absorb calcium from the diet, you don't have enough parathyroid hormone release to ma maintain blood calcium levels, um, you're going to have hypocalcemia, um, excess loss of fluid from the body through diarrhea, uh, those things cause hypocalcemia. Um, <clears throat> We're going to have a problem with over over activity of neurons and so forth, hyper excitability of, of of cells that normally undergo um, excitation through um, membrane potential changes. Um, we're going to have possibly muscle cramps, muscle tetany um, convulsions, and possibly even uh, uh, major heart problems. Depressed excitability of the heart. Um, ironically, if there's too much calcium, which the heart cells need. Um, or too little calcium, which the heart cells need, those will interfere with normal functions of the heart. Um, all right, let's go on and talk more generally about, um, about sodium and potassium and calcium uh, imbalances and their, and their normal regulation. <clears throat> the concentration of sodium, um, it kind of determines 
the osmolality of the extracellular fluid because it's the most concentrated solute. Sodium and its salt, sodium chloride specifically, in the extracellular fluid contribute 280 out of 300 milliosmoles per liter of solute. So most of the solute is salt in terms of number of particles. Um, it normally stays const pretty constant um, because of water shifts. There's so much volume, for example, in the intracellular compartment. If we change the concentration of the extracellular fluid, water will just shift in and or out of the out of the intracellular compartment uh, and, and keep those things relatively equal and steady. Um, the total content of sodium, the total amount of sodium that's in your body, uh, influences the extracellular fluid volume and blood pressure. If you add more salt, uh, you're going to wind up with more water to go along with that salt initially anyway, and that's going to increase the blood volume and blood pressure. Um, oftentimes, we, we are so interested in focusing on the um, clinical manifestations of sodium imbalances uh, including changes in blood volume and blood pressure, that we sort of use the thinking that it is sodium itself that determines the blood volume and blood pressure. Um, in reality, regulation of, of fluid volume and sodium content and concentration are all interrelated. They're all tied together. They're regulated by aldosterone, ADH, thirst, an atrial natriuretic peptide, and they're and they're over overlapping in function some of these hormones and so forth. So, um, rather than try to think purely in isolation of water balance, or sodium balance, or potassium balance, I think it's best to just think about each of these four things: aldosterone, ADH, thirst, and AMP. And if you're uh, careful about the, the the stimuli for each one of those and their functions you'll have a good handle on all of these topics. <clears throat> so what does aldosterone do by way of, of sodium management? Um, aldosterone increases sodium chloride reabsorption in the distal tubule and collecting duct. Water is then reabsorbed um, in, in the collecting duct by osmosis. So we pump a bunch of solute out of the filtrate into the blood um, then the filtrate's getting more and more dilute and water is reabsorbed by osmosis. <clears throat> when aldosterone concentration decreases, less water, the less sodium chloride is reabsorbed in the distal tubule and therefore less water by osmosis and the extracellular fluid osmolarity and volume decrease. Aldosterone always promotes the reabsorption of a hypertonic solution, at least somewhat, because the driving force is active transport of sodium and sodium chloride. And so then water follows and lags behind slightly. So it's a way of reabsorbing water and salt, but a little bit hypertonic. Aldosterone is kind of a slow moving beast. If you remember that aldosterone is a steroid hormone, and we know that steroid hormones are, are produced on demand and maybe a little bit slowly, and they, and they come out into the circulation and they persist for a considerable period of time thereafter. So this is a little bit more slow response than some of the other agents that are in that list that we talked about. <clears throat> what is the regulation of aldosterone? Well, uh, aldosterone is released when the blood pressure goes down because of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. And this is an excellent chance for us to review that system. We talked about it in Chapter 16 and again in Chapter 19, and here we'll wrap up with a discussion of this system one more time. Um, when blood potassium goes up, um, aldosterone is released, and the, the cortex cells of the adrenal gland directly respond to the to the change in potassium concentration. And there's a, the next section of this chapter is about uh, potassium uh, management. So that's when we'll bring that up again. Um, we won't speak about it this time when we talk about aldosterone, when we're talking about sodium. Um, aldosterone is inhibited by atrial natriuretic peptide. We have a check and balance system in place so that the blood volume uh, can only increase to a certain degree before this inhibitor of aldosterone comes along AMP and, and blocks further increases in blood volume. Okay, so the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Renin is released by the granular cells of the juxtaglomerular apparatus. We know that now from our last chapter and we homed in on that specific uh, complex or apparatus. There are three things we said cause renin release from those JG cells. If the sympathetic nervous system is activated, so during exercise or during uh, agitation 
or, or fear or any number of things, um, that causes renin release. Um, if, the, if the filtrate concentration of sodium chloride begins to decrease, the macula densa cells recognize that as a low glomerular filtration rate, and they cause the JG cells to increase their renin production. And finally, um, the kidneys have their own blood pressure sensor, namely those JG cells themselves when they get stretched. And so if there's a drop in blood pressure, uh, the JG cells are, are going to experience less stretch, or granular cells is another name for them, and they will release renin to try to promote an increase in blood pressure. So renin catalyzes the production of angiotensin 1 from angiotensinogen in the circulation. Angiotensinogen is always present, produced by the liver, and renin cleaves off a peptide, producing angiotensin 1, which is then spontaneously converted to angiotensin 2 as the blood circulates through the lungs. The endothelial cells have angiotensin converting enzyme, uh, which can produce angiotensin 2. Angiotensin II into, induces aldosterone release. It, there are receptors on the aldo, on aldosterone secreting cells in the adrenal cortex for angiotensin II, and that will cause release of aldosterone. <clears throat> that causes increase in sodium chloride reabsorption in the distal tubules. Um, angiotensin II, as you just to review its function entirely, it also causes a powerful vasoconstrictor, which increases uh, vascular resistance, peripheral resistance, and blood pressure in its own right. And here's a nice graphic to review the things we're talking about here. Um, if the body uh, content of sodium goes down, <clears throat> that triggers renin release because of changes in the filtrate composition and, and the and the um, the uh, macula densa cells, um, and they'll increase angiotensin II production, and that goes to the adrenal cortex and causes release of aldosterone. Also, as I said, we'll, we'll talk about in the next section on potassium management. Um, if there's an increase in potassium concentration in the plasma, the, the adrenal cortex cells will release aldosterone. Aldosterone goes to the kidneys and causes the later parts of the nephron, the distal tubule and collecting ducts, to increase sodium and chloride reabsorption, which increases water reabsorption by osmosis, and increase the secretion, or decrease the amount of plasma potassium. So we have, as a result of these conditions, increased sodium content, reabsorbing more sodium, increased blood volume, or re reabsorbing water by osmosis, and raising the blood pressure and lowering blood potassium concentration. Atrial natriuretic peptide, we said, is the limiter for aldosterone function and for reabsorption of sodium. Atrial natriuretic peptide um, is released by cells in the atria of the heart when they become stretched, and they become stretched by increases in blood volume, increase in venous pressure. You have to be careful. Oftentimes, we're careless when we say A and P is released when blood pressure goes up. And when we say blood pressure, we mean arterial pressure, unless we say otherwise. And the atria never experience arterial blood pressure. They experience the pressure of the blood coming back, the venous return. That's a different thing altogether. So um, the blood volume, increases in blood volume, increase venous return, and that's what stretches those atria and causes A and P release. Okay, so we have A and P being released, and that atrial natriuretic peptide will cause a drop in blood volume and blood pressure. Um, ANP directly inhibits ADH release from the posterior uh, pituitary gland, renin from the JG cells, and aldosterone from the adrenal cortex. So it's a major important limiter of increases in blood volume. So we're going to block all those hormones that are going to, and, and enzymes that are going to increase blood volume. Um, in, it's so important the function of this hormone that ANP also directly blocks the reabsorption of sodium and sodium chloride in water in the distal tubule. It doesn't just wait around for aldosterone levels to, to, to change in response to AMP. It works directly in the tubule and blocks the reabsorption of salt in water. <clears throat> it also promotes vasodilation, which drops the blood pressure and it decreases the production of angiotensin II. So we have all these things happening. Virtually anything that affects an increase in blood volume and blood pressure is blocked by 
A and P. Now we don't use A and P to shut off all those things. It's just a check and balance system to fine tune the effects of, of agents that increase blood volume and blood, blood pressure to limit uh, those, those functions and to get the blood volume in the right range. Okay, here's a graphic explaining those same things. If you like, I think this is a very powerful way to keep these things uh, organized in your mind as opposed to a word slide sometimes. Um, so if blood volume increases, that stretches the atria of the heart. That causes the atria to release ANP. ANP causes the, the JG cells, the granular cells in the juxtaglomerular apparatus to release renin. And renin causes the formation of angiotensin II, ultimately vasodilation and a drop in blood pressure. But renin also uh, decreases um, sodium and, and water reabsorption um, and decreases blood volume. Uh, if we decrease renin, I'm sorry, we'll decrease sodium and water reabsorption. That will decrease blood volume and blood pressure. Um, <clears throat> Hypothalamus, how is the hypothalamus going to be affected? Atrial natriuretic peptide reduces ADH release. And so uh, if we have less ADH, we're going to reabsorb less water in the collecting duct of the kidneys. And that's going to, re that's going to reduce the blood volume and blood pressure. I'm sorry if I kind of went off sideways on this first column here. If we have uh, AMP will inhibit renin release which inhibits angiotensin II production, inhibits sodium reabsorption and water reabsorption. Okay, um, <clears throat> the adrenal cortex, um, AMP, inhibits aldosterone release. So if there's less aldosterone, we're going to reabsorb less salt and water in the distal tube and collecting duct and have a decrease in blood volume and blood pressure. So major, major important hormone to, uh, to control the, the, the sort of ceiling on increases in blood volume and blood pressure and sodium content. So as you can see, sodium isn't just all on its own controlling the blood volume willy-nilly. We have a way of, of blocking sodium reabsorption, in fact, increasing sodium excretion when there's too much sodium and blood volume on board. <clears throat> People with Addison's disease have a problem with, with respect to sodium management. Um, if you don't have aldosterone, uh, then we're, we're not going to be able to reabsorb, reabsorb enough sodium chloride and water uh, from the forming urine. We're going to be peeing a large amount and having a low blood volume, perpetually low blood volume, uh, low blood pressure, and too much potassium. If there's no aldosterone, we're not only not reabsorbing enough salt, we're, we're not secreting enough potassium. So we have hypovolemia, hyponatremia, and hyperkalemia when we have uh, Addison's disease. You can con con you can I'm sorry compensate by consuming extra amounts of salt and water to offset these these imbalances because of of Addison's disease for to some degree. Here's an interesting little aside, a clinical observation. Um, sometimes when people have severe electrolyte deficiencies, they have a strong craving for for foods that are very high in salt that they otherwise might not necessarily even, even eat. Uh, so people with Addison's disease, for example, may be inclined to eat salt meats and so forth. Um, pica is a condition in which people are inclined to have a desire, a yen, to eat chalk or clay or a lot of starch because they have a deficiency in minerals such as iron. So that's just unusual since we're talking about imbalances of, of um of electrolytes. Here's a funny, not funny in terms of humor, but an interesting, unusual clinical um, manifestation in people that have uh, some kinds of mineral imbalances. <clears throat> also, sex hormones uh, impact reabsorption of sodium. Estrogen increases sodium reabsorption in the distal tubule and water, therefore. And so uh, when the estrogen levels climb during the monthly cycle of, of hormones in women, um, they tend to accumulate sodium and water and actually do become uh, bloated as, as the old saying goes to some degree and different people to different degrees. Uh, progesterone actually decreases sodium reabsorption. Glucocorticoids, cortisol increases sodium reabsorption. So the stress hormone that, that helps us respond to stress, have good cardiovascular performance uh, in, re in reaction to some need to do something about the problem, uh, we're going to increase blood volume by, by increasing reabsorption of sodium, multiple ways of getting at increasing cardiovascular function. <clears throat> Baroreceptors, 
baroreceptors, um, if there's a um, an action of the sympathetic nervous system or a decrease in sympathetic nervous system to the kidneys, that'll cause afferent dilation of the of the uh, arterials going into the into the glomerulus. If the afferent arterioles dilate, that's going to increase the capillary hydrostatic pressure, increase the glomerular filtration rate, and we're going to have an increase in sodium excretion and water output. So that's going to reduce blood volume and blood pressure. Um, and here's kind of a summary slide of all the things that we've talked about relating to sodium and water balance. And so I won't run through every single part of this diagram with you. I encourage you to take a look at this diagram and follow along and make sure that each one of these um, these arrows and boxes is familiar from at least one part of our discussion in chapter 19 or as we've been discussing it already in this chapter and in chapter 25. If there's any part of this diagram you can't really explain why they've drawn this arrow, try to go back and find the section of the chapters that deals with that topic and review that a little bit so that you can fill that in. If you just can't figure it out, send me a note and I'll get back to you. Um, all right, regulation of potassium balance. Potassium is very important uh, in terms of PA or, uh, plasma regulation. We said that potassium is so important for uh, maintaining resting membrane potential of excitable cells and for repolarization after action potentials that it's, it's, it's critical to life to maintain uh, the potassium concentration around 4 to 4.5 millimolar in the plasma. So a very tight regulation there. <clears throat> If we have hyperkalemia, as we saw in that green box earlier, um, that will cause uh, imbalances in the resting membrane potential. Specifically, it'll cause excitable cells to depolarize. We're going to change the difference in concentration across the membrane, which will change that resting membrane potential. And in fact, if you raise the potassium too much, the cells will not be able to, they won't, they'll basically go past threshold and they'll be inex completely inexcitable. Your heart will stop immediately at that point and that will be the end. If you have decreasing uh, potassium concentration, hypokalemia, they're going to hyperpolarize the membranes of excitable cells and they'll be too hard to, to depolarize. They won't respond to the proper stimuli and so it'll cause um, inactivity of, of neurons in the nervous system and so forth. Um, so anytime we interfere with, with this ion that's so important for action potentials and repolarization, the heart is probably the most critical element in this in the, in the realm of activity and so the heart may experience arrhythmias and possibly uh, complete dysfunction uh, if there's an inappropriate level of potassium. So just to make sure we emphasize the importance for survival of keeping potassium levels normal. So every bit of potassium you eat in your diet must be excreted in the kidneys to keep the potassium levels constant at all times. Um, here's an interesting thing we have not ever mentioned about potassium. Um, Potassium, it will exchange with hydrogen ions in the intracellular fluid. So if there's a rise in potassium, potassium ions will push their way into cells, if you want to think about it that way, in exchange for hydrogen ions. And therefore, there will be an acidosis. You'll have extra hydrogen ions appearing in the circulation, in the extracellular fluid that used to be inside the cells, and you'll have uh, a low potassium concentration possibly, or at least if there's a high potassium it'll happen, you'll have an acidosis. Um, if you have an acidosis for some other reason, that will drive potassium out of the cells and you'll have hyperkalemia. So there's this yin and yang effect with potassium and hydrogen ions. Um, if, you have a, uh, if, um, if you have an alkalosis, uh, there's not enough hydrogen ions in the circulation, um, <clears throat> that'll cause High, uh, potassiums to move into the into the extra intracellular fluid, I should say, and you'll have hypokalemia. So these are just some it's an interesting relationship between potassium and hydrogen ions. <clears throat> we'll be talking more about regulation of pH balance, and we'll mention that effect on potassium concentration in the extracellular fluid again. <clears throat> uh, aldosterone, the influence of aldosterone on potassium. Uh, we've talked about this a lot, so I don't mean to, to uh, overdo, but um, aldosterone promotes secretion of potassium in the distal tubule and collecting duct. So if potassium levels go up, the adrenal cortex releases aldosterone. Aldosterone causes secretion, meaning 
putting potassium into the forming urine and it will be excreted in the urine so that will bring the potassium levels back down very very critical function of aldosterone and people without aldosterone um, potentially have life-threatening hyperkalemia <clears throat> It's a, it's a complicated picture uh, looking at the, the, the regulation of potassium in the kidney. There's a whole bunch of interrelated factors. I had an, a fun time reading about that the other day. And there's still some questions out there in terms of overall uh, details of, of main, uh, controlling uh, potassium concentrations, potassium secretion, and reabsorption in the kidneys. But well, I think we have a good handle on the primary mechanisms. Uh, one other interesting thing that your author has brought to our attention is that oftentimes salt substitutes these are um, ionic compounds that will trigger the appropriate sensors in our in our oral cavity and the taste buds so that we enjoy our food but for people that shouldn't be taking in high uh, sodium chloride who have hypertension for example problems managing uh, sodium and volume uh, sodium content and volume of their of their body fluids um, uh, those salt substitutes are high in potassium and that's causing an additional stress on the body. We're going to be taking in a lot of potassium. We need to have plenty of aldosterone that can be secreted to get rid of that potassium from the circulation that's coming into our, our bloodstream from the diet, from dietary intake. Uh, if you don't have enough aldosterone, you eat a lot of these salt substitutes, um, that could be it. How about calcium? Calcium, as we said, and we were looking at that, uh, that first table of of ion imbalances. Calcium is important for so many functions. It's an important signaling ion uh, for virtually every type of cell in your body. Every cell type has different responses to intracellular calcium uh, depending on the hardware and machinery of the cell, the genes that those cells express. But anytime you put calcium in the cytoplasm of a cell, something's going to happen. Um, but it's also important for blood coagulation. We said the clotting factors depend on calcium in the plasma for for their activity as enzymes. And in fact, if you use a, a calcium chelator to grab all the calcium, you can prevent clotting. And that's exactly how we preserve a lot of blood samples to be sent to the clinic for analysis. Um, <clears throat> calcium is important for, for membrane permeability, for nervous system, system function, neurotransmitter exocytosis, I mentioned earlier. Um, um, muscle contraction depends on calcium as the switch that's released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum or comes in from extracellular stores to activate cross-bridge cycling, act activates troponin and tropomyosin moving and so forth. Um, <clears throat> actually, the, the intrinsic conduction system cells of the heart um, have calcium channels for their for their fast phase of the action potential up, uh, depolarization. So a lot about cal, a lot of important functions of calcium. So if you have hypocalcemia, you have hyperexcitability of, of cells that depend on, on, um, on calcium for excitation and for, in the case of muscles, for the muscle contraction step and possible paralysis, hypercalcemia, I said I meant to say hypocalcemia, hypercalcemia can cause heart arrhythmias and problems with neurons. And every cell in your body potentially can have problems when there's too much extracellular calcium because it interferes with their ability to keep it out of the cytoplasm. All right. <clears throat> Regulation of calcium and phosphate are tied together. We'll mainly consider uh, the calcium component. Um, uh, our reservoir of calcium in the body is in the bones in the extracellular matrix. As you know, we talked about hydroxyapatite in the extracellular matrix of bones uh, being made of calcium and phosphate in its crystalline form and mineral form. Um, when there's a drop in plasma calcium concentration, the parathyroid gland releases parathyroid hormone, and parathyroid hormone uh, causes uh, increases in blood potassium by one, causing osteoclasts in the bones to release some of that calcium out of the extracellular matrix, bringing up the blood uh, calcium levels. Um, and in the kidneys, parathyroid hormone promotes reabsorption of calcium from the tubules so that we don't, distal tubules specifically, so that we can save it. Last thing we want to do is, is pee out calcium when there's a low level in the plasma. Um, and also, um, parathyroid hormone uh, promotes vitamin D synthesis by the kidneys, and vitamin D is required for absorption of dietary calcium. So we want to make sure we're taking advantage of all available calcium sources. We don't want to keep depleting the bone matrix all the time in order to keep the calcium levels in the blood at the normal range. <clears throat> this is just a graphic showing those things. Um, <clears throat> 
if there's hypocalcemia, dropping blood calcium, parathyroid hormone is released, which causes osteoclast activity, releasing calcium from the bones, increased reabsorption of calcium in the kidneys, um, promoting increase in blood calcium, and activation of vitamin D synthesis, which allows us to capture any dietary calcium that may be present in the digestive tract. <clears throat> um, anions. Um, Chloride is the predominant anion in the extracellular fluid, so sodium chloride. Remember, we talk about sodium reabsorption. Just think sodium chloride reabsorption uh, for the simplest way to keep that, keep track of that. So sodium and chloride uh, put together per, um, represent by far the bulk, or the, not the bulk in, 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 in mass, but the numbers of particles of solute in the extracellular fluid. Um, um, uh, bicarbonate ion and phosphate are more important intracellular anions, uh, but we'll leave it at that. Um, <clears throat> the next section of our chapter is about acid-base regulation, pH regulation. And so I'll leave you now for the moment and we'll come back for part three of our discussion of chapter 26 and talk about regulation of pH of the body fluids. <clears throat>